going, everybody? Uh, if, I, if I talk like this, can everyone hear me? If I speak loudly, it'll go on the microphone. It's all good. I always like think when I, when I do like talks at conferences, people are like, why is this homeless person like, up on the stage <laughs> talking to us about data science? Because um, I basically dress like a high school sophomore still. Um, so this is me. My name is Josh Wills. I'm the head of data engineering at Slack. I've been at Slack for about seven months. Um, before that, I was at Cloudera, and I was at Google, and I was other places. Uh, I'm, like most people, I'm famous and important because I wrote a tweet once, but I'm kind of tired of talking about it. If you're really interested, you can Google me and find the tweet. It's totally fine. And that is the only hat I own, which unfortunately I did not bring with me today. Um, at Cloudera and Google and other places, I have run both data engineering teams and data science teams. And so now I'm back doing data engineering at Slack. And I want to talk about the relationship between data science and data engineering and how we can make it better. And the first natural question whenever someone wants to do this is say, why bother? Is there really any upside to actually improving the relationship between data scientists, between people who analyze data, and the engineers who provide them with it? We are sort of like a very sort of unhappy married couple who are like need to go to couples therapy or something like that just in order to be able to honestly look at one another. Like it's a really, really bad relationship in the grand scheme of things. Except apparently in Netflix, as Kurt Brown will tell us later. <laughs> And this is really kind of sad to me. And this, this is sort of heartbreaking because I, uh, I spend a lot of time like, I kind of think like for my next career, I want to be like a therapist for data engineers. <laughs> like I actually, I sort of think that I could actually make much more money if I was just like provide, like a sort of executive coach or whatever for like data engineers. Because I swear to God, if I had a nickel for every time some like the first data engineer or the first data scientist at some little startup emails me or sends me a LinkedIn message and is like, hey, I could use some advice on what it's like to be the first person at whatever. And they're all like really kind of sad and miserable. Like it's just they're very unhappy. Um, you either have like a data engineer who's spending all their time like writing SQL queries and creating dashboards and answering questions for business users when they really want to be doing cool data engineering stuff. Or you have a data science analytics type person who is spending all their time running around, logging, collecting data, trying to run experiments trying to convince engineers to do stuff for them, and they would just really give anything for a data engineer. So like data scientists, data engineer, they would really like, when it's just them by themselves, they're very lonely. And, and so that's sad, and they kind of want, they want like each other, they want that good relationship. Um, but somehow things go wrong, and, and I, when I think about like why, why do things go wrong, it's fundamentally because we really want different things. Data engineers and data analysts, we really want different stuff. Um, Data analysts want to basically do really interesting analytics and find insights and build machine learning models because those are the things you do to get to come talk at conferences like this and look really cool in front of all the other data scientists. <laughs> data engineers, on the other hand, they want scalability because scalability is like the word. We're doing stuff at scale. Scale this. doesn't matter what it is we're doing. We just, as long as we're doing it at scale, <laughs> I can go to a conference like this and talk about it, how awesome I am that I'm doing whatever at scale. <laughs> It's just so stupid, guys, really. Like, anyway, this is like the world we live in, though. We want sort of fundamentally different things, and, and the fact that we want different things causes tension. Um, I've, I've sort of given this talk a couple of times now, and people always resonate with this slide. Um, so let's, let's kind of go around. Let's, it's, it's, seriously, I, like, I know it's, it's funny and everything, but it's also super important, because this, this is like a real, this is a real, like photos and stuff like that. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Let's go around the infinite loop of sadness. Let's talk about how the infinite loop of sadness works. Basically, um, sort of this way around the loop, like from basically what happens is the business makes unreasonable, ridiculous requests of the data science team. The data science team makes unreasonable, ridiculous requests of the data engineering team. The data engineering team makes ridiculous, unreasonable requests of the ops team. And then the ops team goes to the business and says, hey, we need a crap load of money to support all of the ridiculous, unreasonable requests we've received. <laughs> And it just goes on and on and on like this basically forever. This is the infinite loop of sadness. It basically, it's, literally, it spirals out of control. It's funny, but in that kind of like cringe-inducing way, it's funny, right? This is, this is funny, except unless you've lived through it, and then it's just, you know, infinitely sad. All right. Uh, so as a result of this kind of stuff, as a result of our different goals, and as a result of the way that we are structured and the kind of incentives we have, we end up like alone together. We're just sort of like there, and we're together, and maybe we have lunch together sometimes, but fundamentally we're, we're just, you know, kind of living these independent lives next to each other, and it's, it's very sad and way less good than it could be. So let's go back to first principles. Let's talk about how we can repair this relationship, and some thoughts on this kind of stuff. And first principle one for data engineering by far 
In order to build data infrastructure, you only need to understand and appreciate two things, Apache Kafka and Franz Kafka. <laughs> I think the Apache Kafka part is pretty obvious to everyone at this point, but the Franz Kafka part, for that I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to my old friend, uh, David Foster Wallace, who wrote this great, great article, uh, sort of one of his books about uh, Kafka's humor, like how funny Kafka is. Um, and how, uh, how students, how college students can have a hard time understanding Kafka's humor because people are trained to think of humor as something you get, um, the same way that we're taught that a self is something that you just have. And so you can't really appreciate the truly central Kafka joke that the horrific struggle to establish a human self results in a self whose humanity is inseparable from that horrific struggle. In the same way, the horrific struggle to build data infrastructure results in a data infrastructure that is inseparable from that horrific struggle. <laughs> Everything in data is terrible. Like it's just a big, you know, steaming dumpster, file, dumpster fire of garbage. It's just awful. Um, but we make it work. And again, it's, it's, you're trying to always kind of escape the horribleness. You're trying to like free yourself from the dumpster fire when you don't realize the dumpster fire is your home. The dumpster fire is <laughs> it's where you belong in some like non-trivial sense. That is the central joke of data infrastructure. And so first things first, let's all appreciate that. We are in basically like the trial or the judgment. We essentially are living in a Kafka-esque universe when we're doing data stuff. So that's thing one. Um, thing two is to understand the infinite loop of sadness and replace it with the infinite loop of empathy, especially for data engineering and data science. Understand that like from the data science, like the data scientists need to know that the data engineers have the exact same relationship with the ops people that the data scientists have with the data engineers. And the data engineers need to know that the unreasonable requests from the data scientists are usually generated by unreasonable requests from the business. We're in the same boat. Your problems are my problems. The people are a little bit different, but we really are in this boat together. And so that's like the second thing. We need empathy for each other. We need to understand each other before we can really start working together well. How do we solve this problem? One of the ways, really one of the shortcuts to kind of creating that, that sort of bonding and that empathy between data engineering and data science is to build machine learning models. If you are building like full lifecycle machine learning models where you are like taking in data, generate building models offline, deploying them back into production, that nothing is more effective at unifying the data engineering and data science teams than building and productionizing machine learning models because you get to really see the other person's problems in a very, very visceral sense. So any kind of company that's doing a lot of ad tech stuff or doing any kind of payment stuff where fraud modeling is a really big problem generally has a great data culture and that's why all the best data scientists and data engineers want to work at finance companies and ad tech companies. It's because that's where data is like the central thing and it's a really, really, really good working environment. Um, however, not all of us work at companies that have to do big, like hard machine learning models. Um, but all of us work at companies that have to do some form of ETL. And I love this, this cartoon is just like, I, 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 shouldn't, I shouldn't swear, right? It's really, really funny. Um, it's like everybody poops, everybody ETLs. No matter where you are, no matter what you do, everyone takes some data in one place and transforms it to another place. It's just, it's worth, you know, like go Google like everybody poops funny on, on Google Images. This, this is worth checking out longer if you guys can't see it. Um, everybody ETLs. And I would, I, my claim is that the way that you do ETL says a lot about your data culture and the relationship between your data engineers and your data scientists. Um, various options I've seen. I'm so glad I got to reference the Bobby Tables thing from the previous talk. So this is, this is the, one of the advantages of doing your slides five minutes before your talk, is you get to like insert jokes at the last possible second. Um, option one is SQL-centric ETL. And Facebook is for me kind of the canonical example of SQL-centric ETL. Facebook does almost all of their ETL in Hive. They do it almost all in SQL. This is Hive and Presto, all that kind of stuff. Analysts are constantly like creating new SQL jobs, generating new tables, big complicated pipelines. And the data engineers are, indentured servant isn't like the right term, but it's something like that. It's a, if, you ever, if you ever come across a Facebook data engineer, like give them a hug. They have a, they have a terrible job. If, is anyone here a Facebook data engineer? You don't want to admit it, I understand, it's okay. <laughs> we, we can have like sort of a, you know, come to Jesus kind of session for you. There's a roughly, roughly two to one relationship between analysts at Facebook and data engineers. And the data engineer's job is to take the steaming pile of SQL garbage that these data analysts write and turn it into something remotely scalable and is remotely coordinated across all of Facebook's data pipelines. 
they write a lot of UDFs to make things like possible and efficient. And like, I mean, seriously, writing a Hive UDF, has anyone actually ever had to do that? It is the worst. It is like absolutely, absolutely terrible. Um, so this is option one, and a lot of companies end up in this state. A lot of companies end up in this state. It is a very natural, very easy state for folks to slide into, um, but it's a very, very sad place to do data engineering. Option number two is JVM-centric ETL. And I'm going to call out Twitter as sort of the, the home of JVM-centric ETL. Um, at Twitter, for a long time, um, all of their ETL was done uh, via Scalding, which is a Scala DSL for writing MapReduce jobs. It has all kinds of crazy, like, I swear to God, like advanced abstract algebra concepts, like sort of piled on top of it for doing various kinds of aggregations where like you need basically a graduate degree in math to like understand like what's going on. And as we all know, uh, math is way harder than something stupid like physics. So like any of the physicists who've talked so far would not be smart enough to work at Twitter. Um, so. But like if you're if you know you're like you know you're like groups and rings and fields and principal ideal domains like Twitter's a great place to be, um, and the result of sort of JVM centric ETL is the data engineers basically turn into like the high priests of data, right? Where the analyst says, please, data engineer, be be so kind as to modify your magical uh, like ETL abstractions to generate the statistic that I want to analyze, right? And I don't necessarily know that this is a good. I mean, I sort of would like to be worshipped like a god. That sounds great. Um, I didn't sort of deliver that. I actually, I, was, I made the mistake of actually being honest in the talk, didn't I? Okay, so it was okay. Anyway. Um, but like, this isn't a great sort of data engineering, like data analyst relationship either. Like, we don't necessarily want to constrain the analysts to not be able to go off and do things and experiment with new metrics whenever they feel like it. Like, that's not necessarily a bad thing either. So, let's come up with a third way. Um, third ways have sort of a general problem in that everyone kind of hates them, like roughly speaking. Like that's sort of the way you know you're like onto a good third way is everyone is unhappy. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the third way that we're working on at Slack, um, which hasn't like succeeded yet, like most third ways, um, but I'm like reasonably optimistic about as sort of my way of kind of coming up with a different sort of relationship and a different, different model for data engineering and data science to interact with each other. And it's based around sort of the state of the world as it is now, the state of data engineering, the state of data science, as, as it is at this moment um, in 2016 where we find ourselves. Um, the first sort of fact of things is the rise of Spark. If data is the new oil, Spark is the new standard oil. I just, I love that joke. Like, no one else finds that funny, seriously? Like, none of this, this is the kind of the octopus that's got its, anyway, that kind of thing. Um, Spark is like, Spark is completely taking over everything. Like they, uh, they have their tentacles in streaming stuff and GPU stuff and machine learning and ET, just everything. There's Hive integrations. And I love it. And I wish it all worked better, like more than anything. I love Spark and I wish it worked better. I love Kafka. You guys love Kafka? I love Kafka. Kafka does its thing and it does it extraordinarily well and it doesn't do anything else. And I love that. <laughs> Spark. <laughs> Spark does a lot of things. It does all of them pretty well, like, but there's always just little, you know, just deets that, ah, oh, just drives me crazy. Anyway, that said, Spark is the new reality. Spark is like the default go-to sort of data processing engine that almost anyone is going to use at any new company, anywhere you go these days. Spark is taking over. So that's sort of fact one. Fact two, there are way too many streaming engines out there right now. Uh, at Google, we had this joke that there are two ways to solve any problem, the way that is deprecated and the way that doesn't work yet. <laughs> wasn't it, actually, it wasn't so much a joke as it was like a, a statement about reality, actually, now that I think about it. Um, and right now, uh, batch processing is deprecated, and stream processing doesn't work yet. That, that is the world we find ourselves in. There's Spark streaming, Samza, uh, Kafka's got a new thing, there's Flink, there's Storm, there's all these different engines out there, and none of them really work that well. Like honestly, like we have not solved the streaming problem yet in any kind of remote sense. And I, as someone who would like to write some streaming data pipelines so that I can move on to the new hotness, am sort of left with trying to decide between all these different engines, which one should I choose? I have literally no idea. They all seem like basically terrible, terrible ideas to me. I'm gonna choose one. It's gonna be the wrong choice. Doesn't matter which one it is. Like, it's, you know, it's like Russian roulette or something like that, right? It's just a horrible kind of situation. So there's too many streaming engines, and I don't know which one is going to win, and this makes me sad. 
Um, thing three is sort of this, this knowledge and this awareness of streaming design patterns. And, and I actually give a lot of credit to the Google folks, um, to Google's like Cloud Dataflow and Apache Beam and all that kind of stuff they're doing, for like talking about streaming data pipelines and sort of the abstractions and ideas behind them in a way that is even like remotely intelligible to human beings. Like it's, it, it takes some work, it's hard, but I, I keep having conversations with people at various companies around the valley and around San Francisco where like they are clearly onto something with this stuff. Like there's, there's ideas here around windowing and stuff like that that resonate with a lot of different people that I'm optimistic about, even though I don't know which of those different streaming, open source streaming engines I just mentioned, those ideas are actually gonna truly manifest themselves in, in a way that is workable, operational, monitorable, doesn't need to be restarted every 24 hours because it's garbage collection is, anyway. I don't know what's gonna happen there, but I, I feel like we're starting to have the right conversations around how to design these systems and how to design these pipelines. Um, and last but not least, I think, and I'm, I'm sort of hopeful that maybe for the first time ever in data engineering, we can stop talking about scalability. Like that would just be absolutely fantastic if we could stop talking about scale. Scale is like solved. If you, unless you are like Google or Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter, scale is solved. Use the thing that Facebook, Twitter, Google, LinkedIn has open sourced. Use that, it scales, that's it. Problem solved. No more conferences on scalability, please. Right, that's it, no mas. The real problem is change. The real problem is change. The real problem is the fact that all of this stuff, the underlying data, the downstream metrics, all the machine learning models, everything is changing all the time. Change is the real problem. How do we manage change uh, in a sort of reasonably, I'm gonna cringe when I say it, scalable way? <laughs> We need like a different word, like a better word. But that's, that's the real problem. Change is the real problem. Let's stop talking about scale. Let's start talking about how we manage change. All right. So the approach that I've been, I've been sort of talking about with my team and I've been trying to convince everyone to, to sort of adopt is inspired a little bit from deep learning. Um, in particular, sort of the core deep learning libraries like Torch and Theano. Um, they all have sort of a very low level systems implementation done in C++ or you know, using CUDA libraries or whatever that leverage GPUs and are super, super high performant. And then a high level scripting language for doing most of the actual configuration stuff that you need to do to run a model. And that can be Lua or Python or whatever, don't really care, but it's that melding of like low level optimized systems programming for the really, really hard compute intensive tasks and a high level scripting language for all of just the real world stuff that you need to do relatively quickly that's kind of tedious and blah, 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 blah. And I like this model a lot and I would like to adopt it for more and more of the data engineering, data science work we do. Um, one of the other things that I think, this is actually one of the things I think Spark has really made possible for me. Like the thing I love about Spark and I think most people, like the gateway drug for Spark is the REPL is being able to like load up a few terabytes of data into memory and just sit there and interactively query it and come up with an idea and like interactively query it and change your function. It's magical, it demos incredibly well, it's absolutely fantastic. Then you like, late, it's not until like weeks later that you actually have to go read the like 100 long page of configuration options in order to get the damn thing to actually run at scale. Leave that aside, it's a really, really great demo and the ability to like cache data sets in memory gives us a lot more flexibility around our tooling um, relative to MapReduce. With MapReduce pipelines, I was a massive fan of static typing for everything. Because there's nothing worse than writing a huge complex MapReduce pipeline and having it fail at the last step because of like some stupid string to long conversion, right? Um, now, because I have the REPL and because I can like be caching intermediate data sets as I go, if I screw up a type, eh, it's kind of annoying, but it's not that big of a deal, right? I can just kind of fix it quickly in Python or whatever and then go on to the next problem. So, I'm, I, more and more, I think I see us moving towards this model in JavaScript, in PHP via hack and stuff like that, to like not quite static typing, to sort of like loosening, loosening sort of the requirements for static typing at least a little bit around data engineering in order for folks to be able to move faster. Um, Slack origin myth. Um, Slack once upon a time was this game called Glitch. So, so Stuart and Kyle uh, and the other sort of founders of Slack, they have this model where they come up with these games they think are super cool and like no one agrees. Um, but they have some little cool niche feature that people say, oh, that's actually kind of cool, I, that's pretty cool. And that happened with like Flickr and they did it again with Slack basically. So, so Glitch was this really cool, very interesting game that the Slack founders uh, tried to make successful and failed. 
Um, and one of the things that's like really cool about Glitch is that it was, it was a game, and that meant we had like a game engine, and this game engine was written in Java. And we had a sort of Rhino-based, or sorry, Nashorn-based JavaScript engine for actually like writing the levels inside of this game engine. So high-level scripting language for designing levels, doing the kind of like fast work that you want to do all the time. Very low-level Java engine for doing the heavily, heavily optimized systems programming stuff. Much like, not for nothing, all the deep learning libraries out there just done in Java. Um, so what we've been playing with is taking this Java JavaScript engine that was written for this game and applying it to our data engineering problems at Slack. And in particular, um, creating like high-level JavaScript definitions of tables that have various aggregations performed upon them. All the aggregations themselves are actually done in a very low-level Java Scala library. Um, but most of the actual like high-level descriptive business logic extract this field, fill in this, this default value, perform this transform, is all done in JavaScript at a high level. And then we feed the JavaScript into the Java engine. The Java engine goes and grabs all the JavaScript's dependencies, kind of like Node.js style. And then it deploys them out to the cluster and runs an optimized Spark job that is designed to compute all of the different aggregations in a single pass over a cached data set. Kind of weird, right? Um, yeah, I'll post these slides up on the internet so like, folks can read them later. And hopefully we'll open source this thing once we you know, actually get it working. Um, but nonetheless, this is like the way I'm thinking about these problems. This sort of like slowly, gently, statically typed environment that you can still like, hack in very, very quickly. Um, no one likes JavaScript. Like everyone hates it. I think that's probably a fair statement. Like, but everyone like knows it. The nice thing about having a language everyone hates is it's like embarrassing if you can't write it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so it's like if you can't write it, then like, wow, what's what's wrong with you? How could you consider yourself not even a not even an engineer but an analyst? Right? Everyone can write JavaScript, and that's kind of great. So table declarations can be done. Code can be written. Um, you can write sort of these. This is actually like actual little snippets of the code that processes our logs, which are called slogs. Our client logs are called clogs. Our job queue logs are called jogs. It got a little out of hand, as these naming conventions can. But nonetheless, um, you can process these, these objects, which are just thrift records, um, via JavaScript to do whatever extractions on them you want, do whatever kind of complex logic you like, without having to drop down into, say, Java to write UDFs for Hive or whatever other language you're talking about, but also not requiring that everything be in Scala or everything be in whatever all the time. And last but not least, one of the nice things about doing all this stuff on Spark is Spark SQL. Again, Spark SQL mostly works. Um, and when you need to basically do something simple in SQL as part of a precursor to like one of your JavaScript functions, you can just do that. Just declare that and we will execute your SQL using Spark SQL for you and then propagate that information. So JavaScript, whenever you need to do scripting, whenever you need to write custom logic, SQL when you don't, very, very cool. So yeah, that is roughly like the brave new world that we're aiming for. And I sort of pride myself on getting conferences that are running late back on schedule. And so with that, uh, thank you all very much. Oh yeah, we're hiring. So. Oh, yeah. oh, I'm Any, do we do, we do questions? Or? Yeah, we can, we, right. we've got uh, time for a couple of questions. Again. Yes, ma'am. Yes, of course. How you, you doing? Can. Yeah, guys, straight walking up there. with a mic. Me? Finally! Oh my god. <laughs> okay. How you doing? My check. I'm yep. good. How are you? Good. Thank you. Um, so, thank you for your talk. I do what um, I can. <laughs> we all do. We try. Um, I wanted to just start off by saying I love Slack. Um, we actually, oh, I'm a mid you. student, <laughs> and we uh, we use uh, Slack at mids. Okay. in this program, and I, at the company I work at, we actually started using Slack, and it just took off. I'm so glad, that's wonderful to hear. That's just like, I just, I dollar signs. I mean, that's just fantastic. I mean, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. But I actually Did I say that out loud? Oh my God, well, thank you, okay. I, yeah. had a, I had a real question, actually. Um, sure. In your infinite loop of sadness or empathy, or yeah. whichever one it is, yeah. um, you had a quadrant that said business. Yes. And I work in product management. Yes, and you're, I want you're in that quadrant. <laughs> Well, I, I figured you were implying that when you showed the infinite loop of now sadness. Now I'm explicitly stating it. I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it is explicitly understood. But my question is, when you talk about kind of like reconciling that loop of sadness and making it like loop of empathy, at Slack particularly, what yeah. role does product management play? And the reason why I'm asking is because when you look at, when I look at Slack or what I hear about Slack, mm. I mean, you've been around for 
three two years two years yeah three two two years two years nothing and years, um yeah. yeah and you have what like you're pushing i'm told like three million active users a day that's right so there's a product component in there somewhere how does oh, yeah. that fit into the mix oh that, that is a great question um god this is sort of thing like we're recording this right ah uh, so so here's the problem it's like I basically think Stuart Butterfield is like roughly, and this, this is just gonna, this is cringe inducing, and I, I hate that we're recording it. I think he's basically like what we have, he's like Steve Jobs, roughly speaking, for our, he's been trying to do Slack for like 15 years. Like, this is not a new thing for him. He has always done some IRC on steroids thing at every company he has ever had. Um, and it just kind of finally came together. And I just, I mean, it's gonna sound kind of weird, but I mean, data doesn't like give birth to companies. You need product, sort of visionary, like you need a vision, right? You can't like optimize something that doesn't exist. Um, you need product vision to guide you. And this is going to sound like a terrible answer, um, but I mean, like Slack is not really a data-driven company yet, in most ways. I still think Stuart has a vision that will carry us forward for like at least another 18 months or so, before like really we need to get into truly scaling out the company through metrics and data. And you have a question, okay? So yeah. Yeah. Because I know you guys are doing um, stuff with um, bots. Yes. Kind of opening up yes. Bots. Yes. Like, but that's just like the right thing to do. I mean, that's like you don't need any data to tell you that's like the right thing to do. <laughs> it is. It's my secret plan. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> oh my God. No one, please hear. Don't say anything. Yeah, it'll be fine. <laughs> you did. It was, so it was, it was fairly transparent. Is what you're saying? Okay. Gotcha. All right. It's good. All right. Not a very good plan then. Yeah, no, it, it is, and it will be, and it will, and it will be one of the great data-driven companies in the world. And, but it's not yet. And yeah. Will and become so. I think it's all about hiring. I think the reality is, as you scale and as you grow and as the opportunity becomes bigger, we hire more and more product managers who are used to working in data-driven environments, as opposed to like sort of very early stage startup vision driven environments. And that's basically the transition. I had this sort of ridiculous idea in my head that I could go to a company and just show up and bring data and be like, here you go, here's all your data. And people would suddenly become data driven as a result. Does not remotely work that way. It's all about the hiring. It's all about the people in the room asking the right questions. And it's just, it's like the nature of a company. It's just like the life cycle of a company as it grows and changes to become much, much more data driven just because you have to. There's not a way to scale one person's vision beyond a certain point without leveraging data. Let's take one final question. Yeah, right that was, here. sorry, it was a super long question. Yeah, how are you doing? Hey Josh, I'm good, thank good you, now. that was awesome. It really um, was. I, I thought so, I was, right. I, I was laughing a little too much, but um, <laughs> at the company that I work, and I, I wanted to get your insight on this, we've been transitioning for the last year or so to something that we named a DPaaS, so Data Platform as a Service, Okay. And, and what they're trying to do is to kind of like step away from I guess the hellhole that you're describing yeah. and, and basically give data tools and the ability for their product manager or data scientist to really interact with the data pipeline and, and not really need the, yeah. the data engineer to, to have to like build everything. Yep. Um, so away from like the high priest kind of model roughly. Uh, it, a bit. Step away from the high priest piece. They literally just set it there and you can kind of like walk along and set up your own map reduce job or, mm -hmm. or whatever on mm -hmm. your own without having the knowledge of what's going on. Okay. Um, is that something that maybe could fit into that brave new world that you're talking about or ha have you thought about something like that? Oh, so I think we're already in that world. I think roughly like I don't, I don't consider Slack to be like one of the high priest sort of shops. We have a, like a, quite a few Scala pipelines written in Spark that do like fairly fundamental things that you know generally like our very core logs and our very core data. Um, but downstream of that, there's like a ton of SQL and the analysts are free to go write and run whatever they want like as well they should be. Um, I'm hoping, like, the problem I have with, like, SQL as a long-term strategy is the whole batches deprecated thing. Like, I would like to move them over to JavaScript and Java land, if only because I want to make it easy to move the computations they define onto streaming pipelines as well as batch ones. And so that's sort of, like, the tooling-wise what I'm trying to aim for. In terms of, like, the data platform stuff, I feel like at least at Slack we're, like, already there. It's not a problem for anyone to go get access to data or, you know, like, modulo, like, you know, basic policy and security kind of stuff like that, right? Like, no one can access, like, messages and stuff like that. That's, that's sort of a no-brainer. Um, so, yeah, it's more of, like, it's a little, I guess it's a little bit higher up. Like, once you have that platform and you have it available for everyone to use, what 
tool should you like make available to them for the really sort of standardized canonical stuff you do? Because I still don't want to end up in a world where I have like 800 different tables that have slightly different columns that do slightly different things that mean slightly different things and I have to track down the person who created it to figure out what's going on. It's, I mean, it's sort of, I'm trying to like strike a balance between the high priest model and that sort of like just crazy chaos model basically. It's not necessarily superhuman driven, I guess. I don't really like people. I work in data. <laughs> All right. Cool. Good. Yeah. Josh, perfect. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody.